Oh, hi, I'm the heretic. So the government, defined as an organization with a territorial monopoly on arbitration, it enforces this monopoly through violence, and thus it can give itself legitimacy to do whatever it wants. If you're familiar with this channel, then you know that I HATE government. I hate that it steals your money from you to pay for services you don't even want. After all, if you wanted them, then taxation wouldn't be necessary. I hate that it imposes rules on you without your consent, then pretend it's justified in punishing you for breaking them. That would be bad enough, but then they have the audacity to claim that yes, you did consent. It's called a social contract. The state has no logical basis for anything it does, and its mere existence is unethical, since taxation violates both self-ownership and the non-aggression principle. Thus, I can only conclude that the belief in statism comes not out of logic, rationality, or empiricism, but pure dogma. Hence, why I refer to statism as a religion. Now, on some level, I get why some people believe in statism. It's what they've been indoctrinated into their entire lives. They went to government schools, where it's unlikely that government teachers will teach them anything critical of the government. And because their parents went through similar experiences, they don't know any better either and won't teach their kids to. It's hard to shake off that indoctrination, but even with all that, it's still going up against hard reality. That there's something terribly wrong with the system. That politicians lie or there's too much taxes or regulation, or how banks and big business has too much influence over our lives. All of these are true, mind you. Now, it's one thing to see all that, and still believe that the state should exist. It's another thing to see the state itself as inherently a good thing. An organization that regularly lies to its subjects, steals from them, forces them to act against their will, and restricts their agency is somehow necessarily a virtuous institution. Its existence is not only preferable, but vital. Somehow. You know you're in for a good time when the website is called governmentisgood.com. I wish I were making that up. Seriously, check out the website. It's a gold mine of absolute nonsense. The website is maintained by Douglas J. Amy, Professor Emeritus, whatever the hell Emeritus means, of politics at Mount Holyoke College. He wrote a book in 2011 under the same name, but for the time being, we're focusing on his website, specifically this article. Oh yes, you know you're in for a good time when professors who have probably never worked a day in their life in the capitalist system, or at least the tattered remnants of capitalism, pretend to be super knowledgeable about capitalism. Now, that doesn't mean his argument should immediately be dismissed. Maybe he's got some good insights, the kind of thing that only an outside observer would notice. Let's be honest, though, he probably doesn't. The article itself actually goes on for seven pages. For brevity's sake, I'm just going to focus on the list provided the first two pages, and stuff just before that. God, I love lists. Now that I'm done poisoning the well, hit it! Without a whole host of government rules, capitalism could not exist. Even regulations and social programs help sustain a market economy by fixing many of its serious social and economic problems. This is the thesis statement, so we can't go after it that hard. But let's define our terms. First, I define government at the beginning of this video. As for capitalism, capitalism is the trade of private property. To have capitalism, you need three axioms. Don't hurt people, don't take their stuff, and keep your word. Well, the government violates not hurting people, and the government takes our stuff, and the status priesthood regularly lies to people, so... So, does the government enforce any of these three? Very hypocritically! One of the most common and misleading economic myths in the United States is the idea that the free market is natural. That it exists in some natural world, separate from government. In this view, government rules and regulations only interfere with the natural beneficial workings of the market. Even the term free market implies that it can exist in free from government and that it prospers best when government leaves it alone. A free market can only be free, by definition, in the absence of coercion and restriction. So yes, it does interfere. I mean, it can't not, as it produces nothing anyone would buy voluntarily, generally speaking. What people do buy isn't enough to satisfy consumers to keep the government funded, which means the government's marginal utility is pathetic. You don't need to coerce people into doing things that are clearly in their best interest. I don't need a gun pointed at me to get me to run away from a rampaging bear. 
Nothing can be further from the truth. In reality, a market economy does not exist separate from government. It is very much a product of government rules and regulations. The dirty little secret of our free market system is that it would simply not exist as we know it without the presence of an active government that creates and maintains the rules and conditions that allow it to operate efficiently. If governments really were masters of figuring out how best to efficiently operate a marketplace, then why are they in government instead of the market where their expertise would make them instant billionaires? Judging by the headlines of your articles, I can assume you're a democracy advocate. Even if you thought mob rule could best decide how to operate a business better than the business people themselves, why would you need a government? To you, they're a middleman, filtering the wisdom of the crowd that should be running society. Now it goes without saying, this is untrue. Politicians and bureaucrats aren't punished if their stupid decisions lead to business failures. It's the same thing with mobocracy. Why do they care? They have their own lives to attend to. They have no incentive to care about whether mom or pop shops fail. Markets, like governments, are very much social constructs. The market is a set of behaviors that is structured by rules, and many of the most important rules have been developed and enforced by governments. Without these rules, our prized free market economy would be a stunted and feeble version of what we see today. To see how this is the case, let's look at these essential rules, the vast infrastructure of laws and policies that make a modern capitalist economy possible. We have a free market economy today? Really? News to me? Yes. Let's see, indeed, what rules you think would need to be in place, but either would be in place in the absence of a state for reasons I'll happily explain, or are an impediment to prosperity. Limited liability laws. Capitalism requires capital. Lots of it. But without limited liability laws, investors are unlikely to risk investing their money in businesses. In the 19th century, before the passing of laws that limited the liability of investors, anyone who put money into a business that then went under could be held liable for the debts of the company. They would have their personal assets seized and could be financially ruined. Needless to say, this discouraged investment. Without limited liability laws, the economy would not have access to the capital it needs to grow and prosper. All limited liability laws, as described, encourages investors to invest in riskier businesses. Now, it's worth noting that 19th century America wasn't a free market, ever. You either had slavery or the Gilded Age, as businesses began to use the state to stifle competition in the name of consumer protection or safety regulations. So how banks would structure liability for businesses could vary as they're now participating in a real free market. Banks might be very conservative and risk-averse, which is great, but venture capitalists might be more willing to invest in riskier business models. Investors will do whatever they want, but if businesses want investors, they'll want banks willing to offer limited liability. So of course banks will meet consumer demand. Why wouldn't they? Without the right to own property and dispose of it as you wish, capitalism as we know it could not exist. These legal rights are created and protected by the government. Moreover, in the U.S., the federal courts have extended to corporations the same property rights given to citizens. Corporate property rights, one of the main legal instruments that insulate business from government power, can be created and maintained only by government. Your right to property stems from self-ownership and exists without the state. You don't need the state to defend what is yours, and ethics already informs us that you're justified in defending it. These rights aren't created by government, they're an inalienable aspect of personhood. If the government can grant rights, then they can take it away. Can you therefore say that you really have rights? But here's the thing, do you honestly believe the government protects property rights, really? In Kelo vs. City of New London in 2005, the Supreme Court said the government could take land and give it to someone else for the greater good, you see. Let's not forget that taxation is when the government can just take money from you and you have no say in how much. As I said in a previous video, if they can take your property, then they claim ownership to the labor to get that property. And if they can control your labor, that makes you their slave. And slavery is extremely undemocratic. Law and order. A market system cannot work well without a functioning criminal justice system. Otherwise, organized crime would easily take over large sectors of the business community. Extortion, bribery, kidnapping, and murder would become the reigning corporate model. Without the rule of law, our economy would resemble the mafia capitalism that Russia has suffered from in its transition to capitalism. Hey, look what else I mentioned in the previous video. People will want their persons, family, and property protected, so they'll buy crime insurance which would work with private courts to try and punish wrongdoers. So yes, there'd be law and order without the state. In fact, because these crime insurance companies and private courts would compete with each other in the market, they'd be even better than their status counterparts. 
more cost-efficient, speedier trials, and better accuracy of verdicts. If you're worried about organized crime and mafia capitalism, then you must hate the government, since all government is, is the world's largest protection racket. Here's the thing. I can't go to your house and tell you to give me 30% of your income. I can't then throw you in a cage for failing to do so. Yet somehow, when the state does it, it's not only excused, but they're applauded for doing so. If that's what law and order is, then I'll take my chances with anarchy. Bankruptcy protection. Business is inherently risky, and one of the largest risks is business failure, particularly during recessions and depressions. In the 19th century, before the creation of bankruptcy laws, business failures would usually sell entrepreneurs with large and ongoing debts, making it impossible for them to have a fresh start and often putting them in debtor's prison. Investors and creditors also often failed to get any of the money due to them. Bankruptcy laws protected otherwise healthy businesses that were temporarily short on funds, and these laws allowed entrepreneurs to be eventually free from crushing debts. Along with limited liability, bankruptcy rules form a crucial financial safety net for entrepreneurs. It is important to note, however, that bankruptcy laws were passed not simply out of concern or sympathy for failed entrepreneurs, but also as a way to lessen economic risk and therefore encourage more investment in economic growth. Oh look, another bad incentive created by the state that encourages risk by mitigating the cost of being a dumbass. But anyways, I'm sure banks might offer bankruptcy protection as well if they give out business loans. After all, having that contingency in place would look great for marketing. In order to pay for this, the loan might have a slightly higher interest rate or smaller loan amount. Fundamentally, it'll be up to what the consumer is willing to pay for. A stable money supply, without reliable money, banks would be based primarily on barter and thus be extremely limited. In the U.S., before the Civil War, almost all paper money was issued by private banks, not the government. This was an unreliable and incredibly chaotic system. Sometimes merchants could not even accept certain currencies. It also meant there was no real control over the money supply, which has a crucial impact on inflation and economic growth. Widespread commerce and a stable economy both require a stable and dependable money system, one in which consumers and merchants have faith. This can only be provided and maintained by a federal government. <sighs> <laughs> Are you serious? If it's the federal government's job to keep the currency stable, then they really suck at it. The Great Depression was caused, in part, by rapid monetary deflation. The subprime mortgage crash of 07 and 08 was caused, in part, by the cheap monetary supply of the Federal Reserve. Now let's talk about inflation. Since the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, the dollar has lost 95% of its value. In what universe is that stability? Maybe this chart will help, showing the price of gold in how many dollars per ounce it was worth. It starts at 1791 all the way to 2017. It starts jumping up around the Great Depression, but once Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard completely in 1971, well... You can see just how violently it spiked. I'm pretty sure gold didn't get any rarer, just saying. Now, currency is a commodity like anything else in the market with a supply and demand. Different currencies will compete with each other, and the most valuable and stable will be the ones people exchange with. If Bitcoin has proven anything, it's that we don't need the state to have a monopoly on the medium of exchange. Patents and copyrights. Large portions of our economy will grind to a halt if the government did not grant patents and copyrights. Without this massive intervention into the free market, the music, drug, publishing, and software industries could not exist. Bill Gates liked to think of himself as a self-made man, but he could not be the one of the richest men in the world if the government did not make it illegal for anyone but Microsoft to buy and sell Windows. Patents and copyrights are absolute garbage. The way a patent works in the U.S. is that a party files to the patent office diagrams, schematics, what have you, of their idea, and if it's original, they get granted a multi-year monopoly on that thing. Because it's the government doing this, this gets abused. Amazon has a patent on photographing things in front of a white backdrop. They also have a patent on one-click shopping. Apple wanted a patent on the rectangle with rounded corners, but thankfully they were denied. Oh wait, no they weren't. And they used this patent to sue Samsung for using smartphones with the shape of rounded corner rectangles. Or how about Personal Audio, who patented podcasting? Anyone remember Martin Shkreli, the asshole who took a drug for treating AIDS and jacked up the price from $1,350 to $750? Yep, patents prevented competition. Maybe one day I'll do a video on how Thomas Edison abused the patent system and basically screwed over Nikola Tesla. Suffice to say, patents suck and discourage the free market of ideas and innovations. 
Will there be knockoffs without patents? Yeah, but the fashion industry has been dealing with that for years, and it's just encouraging them to work harder to make the authentic garment a status symbol. Why wouldn't this work for everything? Banking regulation and insurance. As we have seen recently, a capitalist economy depends heavily on stable banks to finance growing businesses. But banks are inherently vulnerable to runs, where worry depositors all seek to take out their money at the same time. Banks cannot survive runs because they have loaned out most of the money deposited with them and therefore cannot pay it out to a large number of depositors at once. Before the passage of banking regulations and federal deposit insurance, banks regularly had runs and failed. The main reason we had no disastrous runs on banks and money market funds during the financial panic of 2008 was that the government was there to guarantee those deposits. Okay, now you're just being disingenuous. Your paragraph talks all about banking insurance, but you lump it in with banking regulation. No, get that sophistry out of here. Banks are so heavily regulated that employees can't take a piss without a government bureaucrat instructing them when they can, in what direction, and how much. Let's be honest as well. A lot of these regulations are absolutely terrible. The Community Reinvestment Act, for example, created all sorts of regulations on banks for how many loans in proportion they can give to poor people who would be unable to afford a mortgage. This created a high number of subprime mortgages, high-risk mortgages that were unlikely to ever be paid back. If you're paying attention, you can probably already guess what it was that caused the 2008 financial crash. Here's a hint. It was the government's fault. Corporate charters. Capitalism today is corporate capitalism, but the corporation itself is a creation of government. Corporations can come into being only through charters, the legal instruments by which state governments allow businesses to incorporate. These charters and state business laws define what a corporation is, how it is organized, how it is governed, how long it may exist, who has a say in decision making, the rights of stockholders, the extent of its liability, and so on. Most states also retain the right to revoke the charters of corporations that break the law or harm the public interest, though this power is seldom used these days. This is... Kind of accurate, but it doesn't tell us anything why we need corporate charters, which we don't, because they suck. They're a way for big business to gain special privileges over their competition. It's for the greater good, you see. Businesses could not operate effectively without laws governing commercial transactions. Few would risk doing business on a wide scale unless there was some way of making and enforcing contracts. Who would sell goods if they couldn't be sure they would be paid? And who would buy goods if they couldn't be sure they would receive them? The Uniform Commercial Code is a set of legal rules that determines, among other things, what a valid contract is, how contracts can be enforced, and various remedies for fraud, default, etc. It is over 800 pages long and covers every aspect of commerce in great detail, including laws governing the sale of goods, payment methods, receipts, warranties, titles, shipping of goods, storage of goods, how sales are financed, and the leasing of goods. It is the legal infrastructure that allows businesses to be conducted smoothly and reliably. Come on, you think people won't figure out how to keep their word in the absence of the state? Of course they will. Contracts will likely include clauses that make a violator liable to damages and even lists the private arbitrator to mediate a contract dispute. You know, private courts. Without a government to outsource this responsibility to, the reputation of businesses will become even more valuable. Once a business proves itself unreliable and untrustworthy, nobody's going to do business with them. Thus, businesses will be incentivized to be honest in their dealings, to keep their promises, and to fulfill their contracts. If they don't, then they'll be bought out by the businesses who will do these things. Given how often the government breaks its promises, them expecting me to keep mine comes off as rather hypocritical, and life's too short for hypocrites. International trade law. Global capitalism would be impossible without trade. Governments create legal frameworks, the treaties and international trade laws, that facilitate and make this trade possible. Free trade is a misnomer, because it implies that this is international trade that exists free of any political framework, but this is hardly the case. The North American Free Trade Agreement, for instance, makes up two volumes and is over 900 pages long, covering such things as tariffs, customs, dumping, corporate and investor rights, intellectual property rights, financial services, government procurement, and dispute resolution procedures. It also establishes a secretariat, a commission, dispute panels, scientific review boards, eight industrial sector committees, and six working groups to oversee the implementation of this agreement. It turns out that free trade requires a great deal of regulation. You just described the overly bureaucratic, labyrinthian kudzu knot that is NAFTA and assume that because NAFTA is so complex even a minotaur couldn't navigate the maze, that means it's necessary for free trade. Somehow, this proves nothing. International trade is actually very simple. Behold, I have three apples. Chica biet, comrade. I have vodka. Want to trade your vodka for my apples? Sounds great. See? Not that hard. We didn't even need a coercive monopoly telling us that the trade was necessary. 
Here's the thing about exchange. If a trade is happening, then both sides benefit. No force is necessary because the exchange could only happen if both sides benefited. When force is introduced, the exchange can only be detrimental to one or both exchanging parties because otherwise the trade wouldn't happen. You don't need 900 pages of regulations or racehorses or commissars to get people to exchange. You just need two people who want what the other has. They certainly don't need a coercive monopoly either. Enforcement of laws. All these rules and laws that facilitate businesses and markets have to be enforced. Otherwise, they are worthless. Just as international trade treaties require elaborate enforcement mechanisms, so do all our national laws that facilitate the business process. And this is no small effort. We and our government spend billions of dollars every year to provide police and protect private property, courts to interpret and enforce contracts, and agencies to protect patents, oversee banks, and act as watchdogs in the stock and bond markets. It is revealing that most civil suits are not brought by individuals harassing corporations, as conservatives would have it, but by businesses suing other businesses. The courts are indispensable for resolving business disputes and thus ensuring the smooth operation of the economic system. Yeah, I already covered this, so I won't repeat myself. Interesting how his arguments for limited liability and bankruptcy basically come down to fearing businesses might fail. Businesses should fail to free up resources and market share for more productive businesses. Now, do we need limited liability or bankruptcy procedures? I don't know, but if consumers want it, entrepreneurs can provide it in a market free from government force. So what's left to say? Earliest examples of maritime trade date back 90 millennia. That's 90,000 years. That makes trade literally older than the wheel. Now trade implies property. After all, if you both own something, or neither of you does, then you can't exchange it any more than you can exchange with yourself. Well, I mean you could, but you wouldn't know the value of the exchange. Now this further implies mutual recognition of property rights and the promise of contracts kept. Otherwise, the trade could not take place. Now while the theory of capitalism wouldn't be crystallized until Adam Smith, the practice of exchanging property of capitalism would predate the state by over 100,000 years. The earliest known state was documented around 3500 BC in ancient Mesopotamia. So no, we don't need government to trade. Now I know what the next question is, do we need government to trade efficiently? No. As I stated earlier, if politicians and bureaucrats knew best how to manage markets, then they would make a killing in the market rather than be politicians and bureaucrats. So if such people did exist, the market is where they would go, which makes this a self-correcting problem. People with the skill to manage markets in industries efficiently go into the market to become millionaires and billionaires which means there's fewer people who can do that in the government, which means the idea that politicians and bureaucrats can manage markets effectively is self-destructive and ludicrous, defying all reason, logic, and ignoring how incentives work. But even if this were the case, and there was a magical secret amount of judicial overreach, mob rule, and general authoritarianism so a market could operate at peak, peak performance. performance. Why wouldn't a company voluntarily implement it on themselves if it really makes them more efficient? Why does this magical formula require a coercive monopoly to implement? That's because that's all this is. Magic. It doesn't exist. The emperor has no clothes. And more and more of us are starting to realize that. The illusion is being broken and they're scared. Scared that we might realize that we have no use for sophists and demagogues in our society. The indoctrination is breaking, and I can't wait to see what comes of it. I mean, come on! If the literal Neanderthals could figure out how to exchange private property without a coercive monopoly, why can't we? To be honest, though, my favorite part about this whole article is that he wasn't even replying to libertarians, but republicans, as though Mitch McConnell and John McCain are anti-government. Give me a break. Questions? Comments? Critique? Are we better than Neanderthals, like, at all? Should I reply to the rest of this article for a part two? Please say no. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today. Also, shout out to a fan of mine who wished to remain anonymous for this adorable fan art. You know who you are. Stay heretical and stay awesome.